Bible Church, our evening service. It is our communion service, so we're looking forward to celebrating the death of our Lord together tonight. And in light of that, we will not be in Zechariah. We will be in Matthew 26. So I call your attention to the Gospel of Matthew, if you have your Bible with you. It's the first book in the New Testament, Matthew chapter 26. If you're new with us this evening, we welcome you in the name of the Lord. Glad to have you with us tonight. We are in Matthew 26, verse 26 to 30. Matthew 26, 26 to 30. In this particular passage, Jesus is eating the Passover meal, and from the Passover meal, taking bread and wine, and introducing the Lord's Supper. It's a very precious moment uh, for all of us as we contemplate what is recorded here for us. So we, we know we've gone through some of this many times, but we're going to enjoy it again as we focus on uh, our Lord as the Lord's Supper demands it. Matthew chapter 26, and of course, this is the night before Jesus was arrested. This was the night he was arrested, and the night before he died. Matthew 26, 26. And as they were eating, they were eating the Passover, Jesus took bread, that's Passover bread, and blessed it and broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, take eat, this is my body. And he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, Drink ye all of it. For this is my blood, the blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. But I say to you, I will not drink henceforth of this fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. Father, help me to speak and each of us to hear uh, from this very precious section of scripture. Amen. There are three great religious celebrations that are brought side by side tonight in our passage. The first one is Passover. Passover meal is what they were engaged in uh, during uh, this whole section. If we go back to verse 17 uh, and uh, uh, following, we will see that very clearly. Jesus and his apostles kept the Old Testament uh, Jewish feasts, and Passover was one of the most important ones. And so let's go back and get the context in verse 17. Now, on the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, the disciples came to Jesus, saying unto him, Where will you that we prepare for thee to eat the Passover. And he said, go into the city to such a man and say to him, the master says, my time is at hand. I will keep the Passover at thy house with my disciples. This was a yearly celebration to commemorate when the Jews were rescued and redeemed out of slavery in Egypt. They'd been doing it They've been doing it for 1,500 years. It's an amazing thought. For 1,500 years, they've been looking back, that's a round figure, and celebrating their redemption from Egyptian slavery out of Egypt. Once a year, every year, and they did it with a lamb. And they, a Passover lamb was eaten at that service, just as uh, certain of us, when we celebrate, maybe you have a Thanksgiving turkey and a Christmas ham or something like that, they had a Passover lamb. And so the disciples said, well, where are we going to celebrate the Passover? And Jesus had had some communication with someone in the city and had it all arranged where they would eat and told them, what to do, and they did, and the disciples did. Verse 19, as Jesus appointed them, 
and they made ready the Passover. There's quite a few preparations for that, but uh, it's, it's, it's important to know that Jesus recognized those God-given religious feast days. Jesus and his followers kept all the Old Testament feasts, and Passover was one of them. But no one could ever observe Passover like Jesus. He did it in a way no one had ever done it before or could ever possibly begin to do it. Uh, and he is what the Passover represented, a Passover lamb that had to die uh, so that, that people could feed on the lamb and put the blood on the door. It was a wonderful picture of our Lord's death for us, and God gave it. And God gave it for the people to celebrate. And then Jesus, of course, died on the cross, and guess which day he died? Passover Friday. That's not an accident. Now, what the Passover did was it was a celebration of liberation of the Jewish people out of the land of Egypt. They've been slaves there for a, a couple of centuries, and uh, they wanted out. They prayed to be out. They asked God to deliver them from Egyptian bondage. And God did do that, but in the book of Exodus, chapter 12, God gives to us that original feast of Passover. We see it in Exodus 11 and uh, 12 and 13. We see that what, what the original uh, Passover was all about and the biblical instructions for its preparation and what happened and the requirements. And not to keep those requirements would be to break the Jewish law. This wasn't optional for Jewish people. Uh, it was part of being a good Jew. It was a part of being of what they were. And much like we celebrate July 4th, they celebrated Passover because it was their day of independence from Egyptian bondage. Now, hold your place, if you would with me, please, in uh Matthew 26, and go back with me to Exodus 11, 12, and 13. It's the second book of the Bible, Exodus 11, 12, and 13. We do not have time to go through all three of these chapters but I want you to at least glance at them and remind yourself of where they are. And God, God had confronted the gods of Egypt. The gods of Egypt were various idols, and all the plagues, the ten plagues, they were each plague was addressed to a different god. If they, if they worship frogs, God brought frogs and judgment on them, locusts, all that kind of stuff. So each plague was a victory over the demonic worship of the Pharaoh and his, his uh, the people who encouraged that. I had a professor in seminary that wrote a book, Moses and the Gods of Egypt. It was a commentary on Exodus. And he identified for us Professor Davis identified for us each of the gods that were behind the plagues and pointed them out very, very convincingly. So this, there was nothing arbitrary about the 10 plagues. They were all exposing the false worship of the Egyptian people. And so uh, uh, that's what's going on in these early chapters and 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 uh it's it's extremely significant this whole business especially when none of the earlier plagues were sufficient to have pharaoh let them go and that of course was planned by god because god was multitasking god was one 
uh, showing that he was sovereign over all the gods of Egypt, and he worked up from frogs and locusts and <laughs> all of that up to the firstborn, the Pharaoh, but because uh, uh, they worshiped the Pharaoh, and the firstborn would follow his father. And so all of that was significant. But the lesser means have been totally ineffective. Pharaoh said, I won't let Israel go. As soon as the plague was lifted, he backed off. This, as this Old Testament story, and I wish I had time to review it, is prophetic. Lesser means than the death of Jesus work. Wait, here's the commandments good If righteousness could come by the works of the law, Christ is dead in vain. We had the Ten Commandments long before we had the cross. And I ask people, are you going to heaven? Well, I keep the Ten Commandments. Well, no, you don't, because no one ever has. And if you try to keep them, you'll see that you can't keep any of them, not as Jesus interpreted them. So what's God's doing in the whole Testament is showing us lesser means than the cross is not sufficient. Even the blood of bulls and goats can't do it. Even the Passover lamb's blood can't do it. Because your situation is mine is more serious than being living your whole life in slavery. It's more serious than if your parents and grandparents and great grandparents and all your children are all in slavery. Our modern culture gets, you know, we love to rag on slavery, and slavery is horrible, especially slavery in the United States. It's terrible. Our situation was worse than slavery. And what was God's answer? His ultimate answer was the Passover lamb and the plague that would go through Egypt and kill the firstborn of everyone. It was very selective. If you weren't firstborn, you were safe. But if you were the firstborn during that plague, you were dead. Beast or human. But God gave protection. And the protection was the blood of the Passover lamb put on the door. And guess where the ladies, uh, 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 where, where the ladies would have to do after that? You got to wash the door off because there was blood here, there was blood there, and there was blood there. That's the three points of the cross. A living lamb outside the door would not do it. The blood had to be shed. The lamb had to be eaten. Had to be roasted in fire. Because that lamb was picturing the lamb of God to experience the fires of hell for us in the six hours he was on the cross. And God said in the Old Testament, when I see the blood, I'll pass over you. Remember, God said very clearly, all of everybody's got to get in the house together. Everybody's got to have a lamb. You roast the lamb, you eat the lamb, and you put the blood on the door. And when the plague goes through Egypt, when I see the blood, I'll pass over you. So the firstborn in every house, Jewish or even Egyptian, that had the blood on the door were saved. If you didn't listen to God, and everybody had been warned, God had a pretty consistent record. When he announces something's coming, it always came. Can you imagine thinking it's not going to come after nine times it's come, just like God said? So all of this is precious. All of this is very important, and all of it is recorded in chapters 11, 12, and 13 of the book of Exodus. I'm just going to start at 11. And the Lord said to Moses, Yet will I bring one plague more on Pharaoh. 
Won't be a, don't be a, don't need to be another one. This will do it. This one's going to do it where the others didn't get it done. Now, God did the others knowing they wouldn't get it done because he wanted to build up to this. Yet I'll bring one plague more on Pharaoh and on Egypt. Afterwards, he will let you go from here, and he'll let you go. He shall surely thrust you out from here together. Speak now in the ears of my people. Let every man ask of his neighbor, every man or neighbor, jewels and silver and jewels of gold. The Lord gave people favor in the sight of the Egyptians. Moreover, the man of Moses was very great in the land of Egypt in the sight of Pharaoh and his servants, the sight of the people. And Moses said, thus says the Lord. About midnight, will I go into the middle of Egypt. All the firstborn in the land of Egypt shall die. It's going to be a plague from the firstborn of Pharaoh that who sits on his throne to the firstborn of the maidservant who's behind the mill and the firstborn of beast. So man, animal, first one born is going to die. And there shall be a great cry throughout all land of Egypt, such as there was none like it, nor shall be like it anymore. But against any of the children of Israel shall not a dog move its tongue against man or beast, you may know how the Lord has put a difference between the Egyptians and Israel. And all these my servants shall come to bow down to me and bow down themselves unto me, saying, get, get, get all thy servants, get thee out and all the people that follow thee, and after that I'll go out. And he went out from Pharaoh in great anger. So Pharaoh was warned. And the Lord said to Moses, Pharaoh will not hearken to you, that my wonders may be multiplied in the land of Egypt. So, uh, and Moses and Aaron did all these wonders before Pharaoh, and the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart, so he'd not let the children of Israel go out of the land. And the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron, this month shall be to you a beginning of months. It'll be a first month of the year. Speak to all the congregation. He tells them about taking a lamb, a lamb for a house, and if the house is too little, invite your neighbors in. And it says in verse 5, your lamb will be without blemish, a male the first year. You'll take it from the sheep and from the goats, and you'll keep it to the 14th day of the same month, and the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it in the evening. They'll take of the blood and strike it on the two side posts and on the upper doorpost of the house, wherein they shall eat it. And they shall eat the flesh in that night, roast with fire, unleavened bread, Bitter herbs shall they eat it. Eat it not raw nor boiled at all. Roast with fire, its head with its legs, and with the inward parts. Let nothing remain till morning, and that what remains until morning shall you burn with fire. Thus shall you eat it with your loins girded, your shoes on your feet, your staff in your hand. You'll eat it in haste. It's the Lord's Passover. Why is it called Passover? Verse 12. <coughs> For I will pass through the land of Egypt this night and will smite all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, against all the gods of Egypt to execute judgment. I am the Lord, and the blood shall be for you for a token on the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I'll pass over you, and the plague shall not be on you to destroy you when I smite the land of Egypt. Now then in verse 14, he says, you remember this from now on going to be memorial, celebrate the Passover. Now, as we come, obviously the blood is significant, because what's the significance of blood? Well, blood is certainly significant biologically, isn't it? You can't go to the doctor uh, and with any medical problem and not have blood tests. How many of you have had your needle, uh, your arm plucked with a needle? Every one of us probably, right? You, modern medicine basis, what's going on with the blood? Blood is very significant to modern medicine because merit blood is very significant to human life. It's the blood that takes the waste away from the cells. It's the blood that takes food to the cells. you got to have blood. But blood is more significant than that. In the Old Testament, it had ceremonial significance. It has theological significance in the whole Bible. And in Exodus 11, 12, and 13, 
In each chapter, we see something about the blood. In chapter 11, there's redemption by blood announced, announced, announced by God's spokesman. In chapter 12, we have redemption by blood uh, accomplished, accomplished by God's lamb. In chapter 13, we have redemption by blood acknowledged, acknowledged by God's people. They did what God said. They put the blood on the door. They're eating the lamb on the inside. It's a very, it's a, it's a late night meal they're eating, the lamb, it's midnight. Now, lesser means were ineffectual on purpose. And the lesser means uh, were given to show, to contrast those means with the absolute uh, significance of the blood. The Old Testament message was, let my people go. No more slavery. They're my people. The New Testament message is John 3.16. So there's a, there's a biblical uh, background to our New Testament message. We believed and received Jesus as our Savior because we trust in his blood. And so Passover was extremely significant because of its prefiguring what would happen later in history. Passover is a password that grants us access into all the rich truths and blessings contained in the Old Testament. Passover is a pass key to illustrate and authenticate New Testament redemption. Oh, I know how to interpret what happened to Jesus. He's the lamb. Passover is a passageway that leads into the depths of God's word, whether it's the Old Testament or the New Testament. And through the Passover uh, event, over 2 million Jews were redeemed out of Egyptian slavery. Pharaoh said, I give up. Oh, I don't think Columbus has hit, the city of Columbus has hit 2 million yet, but they're, they're, it's getting, it's growing, isn't it? I haven't looked lately. But can you imagine taking the city of Columbus and their suburbs and transporting them to northern Indiana without a bus or a hospital or restaurants or a shopping mall? <laughs> I mean, think of what happened. Two million slaves moved together into the promised land. And what happened to them is a picture of what happens to us because the Apostle Paul said in 1 Corinthians 5, 7, Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. When John the Baptist pointed out Jesus, he said, Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. So this whole Old Testament story is extremely significant, not only in the fact that the Passover lamb saved the first, that the Israelite nation, which was God's firstborn, and, uh, but Egyptian firstborn all died. If you think about that, it's rather awesome. One writer said, the Passover is not simply a matter of a lamb replacing the Israelites firstborn. It's also God purchasing redemption of his firstborn son of Israel through the death of the Egyptian firstborn. You're not letting my firstborn go? I'm taking out your firstborn. Since it was precisely this catalyst that led Pharaoh to call for Israel's uh, release. Satan are, is our Pharaoh who wouldn't let us go. And God did a work to make that happen. In Egypt, I, I don't know if we recognize that plague. You've heard me say this before, but I, I did some, I got on the internet and looked at some stuff and figures about population in Egypt and what the 
population probably would have been 3,500 years ago. And looking at what the scholars believe the population estimate should have been, it's possible that 500,000 Egyptian firstborn died in that plague. If you take, if you take Nagasaki and Hiroshima in World War II and put them together, you only got about 200,000. Think of the devastation of that judgment. And think of the deliverance of God's people, who apart from the blood of the Lamb would have experienced it themselves. Because they were sinners. It wasn't just the Egyptians that were sinners. Oh, how we need sermons about the cross. Oh, how we need hymns about the cross. Oh, how we need ceremonies about the cross. When will we see the power that's in the blood? Nahum Sarna was a Jewish writer. He's a, he was, I think, I'm not sure he's still living. He was liberal and he was Jewish. But he was a, one of these massive Hebrew scholars. And I read his writings on Exodus. And he wrote something like this, denying oneself all benefit from anything. Uh, Leaven, anything leaven during Passover is one means by which the command, remember me, remember me is fulfilled. The Jews would get all leaven out of their house. That was symbolic of sin. When we think of the cross, we say, well, how can I live in sin if Jesus died for me? I need to be confessing my sins. I need to be dealing with stuff. I can't just pretend he didn't die for it. If it cost him his life, I want to deal with it. So the first thing we see in Matthew 26 is Jesus and the apostles are doing what the Jews had done for 15 centuries. The lamb was killed, was eaten, Passover wine was drunk, Passover meal was eaten, and so forth. And Jesus took Passover bread and pass over wine to institute the Lord's Supper. So the Passover meal is over, but the Passover wine and the Passover bread is now used to institute what we celebrate tonight as the Lord's Supper. And we use matzah in our Passover, uh, in our Lord's Supper, because it was matzah that they had at the table. Unleavened bread. Turn back to Matthew 26 and verse 26 and 7. And as they were eating, Jesus took bread and blessed it and broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take ye, this is my body. This is my body. And he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them and said, Drink ye all of it, for this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. This is my blood of the New Testament, of the New Covenant, for the remission of sins. And this is a precious thought. He takes the whole Old Testament and everything and says, that was Old Testament redemption. And what we've been celebrating for all these years, Old Testament redemption out of slavery is a, just symbolic of the ultimate redemption that I am going to uh, uh, achieve with my body. Our Lord 
reveals himself both in actions and words, and the words interpret the actions. Words were needed as an inspired interpretation of events. And the Lord's Supper grew out of the Passover. That's not an accident. It's not an accident that Jesus rode into Jerusalem on the donkey to start out Passover week. It's not an accident that he was crucified on Passover day. And he, he says it's going to be the new covenant. That's what he says in the book of Luke. And that's what he says. This is, this is the blood of the new covenant. The old covenant was the Ten Commandments system. We got the new covenant. The new covenant is mentioned in Jeremiah 31 for the first time. If you, if you preach through Jeremiah, which we've done in this church, we had 30 chapters of nothing but failure. 70 times God mentions, I think it's 70, idolatry that they were and how they were unfaithful to God, and they just failed him right and left. And Jeremiah had to have an iron forehead because the people were so sinful. 30 times, he did, or 30 chapters, of they break the old covenant, which is the Ten Commandments. And then that wonderful new covenant in Jeremiah 31, which includes knowledge of God and forgiveness of sin. And it's something God does in grace. Turn with me to Jeremiah 31, if you would. I, I plead with you to do that. If you don't know where Jeremiah is, Jeremiah lives right between uh, Isaiah and Ezekiel. Lives the book of Jeremiah and Lamentation. Go with me to, so if you see Isaiah in your Bible, you're getting close and go to Jeremiah chapter 31. By the way, Isaiah's is past Psalms, so if you don't know where Isaiah is, go to Psalms and Proverbs, and then pretty soon you'll get to Isaiah, and Jeremiah lives right after Isaiah in the Bible. Jeremiah chapter 31. These Old Testament books are very hard to teach and very hard to hear. But I want to tell you, if you've ever had the privilege of sitting through a whole book like Jeremiah or, or Isaiah or Ezekiel, what a journey it is. But if you pay the price, whether it's reading it at home Take about an hour, an hour and a half, just whatever you have need to read it. Read it all the way through in one sitting. You're going to be worn out by the time you get to Jeremiah 30. If I'm tired of hearing idolatry and unfaithfulness and all this stuff. And then you get to 31, and it's so, it is so good. And so when we get to Isaiah 31, God begins to speak, and God begins to speak about the new covenant because the old covenant didn't work, just like the nine other plagues didn't work on the Egyptians. The old covenant, the Ten Commandments, didn't work on the Jews. Why do people think for 1,500 years the Jews couldn't keep the law, and I'm, I'm keeping the Ten Commandments? Who do you think you are? <laughs> I mean, seriously. Seriously. So anyway, in Jeremiah 31, verse 27, God says, Behold, the days come, says the Lord, that I will sow the house of Israel and the house of Judah with the seed of man and with the seed of beast. And it'll come to pass that if I've, as I've watched over them to pluck up and break down, which he did when he sent them into exile, and to throw down and destroy, and to afflict, so I will watch over them to build and to plant, says the Lord. In those days they shall no more say, the fathers have eaten sour grapes and the children's teeth are set on edge. But everyone shall die for his own iniquity, 
Every man that eats this sour grape, his teeth shall be set on age. Behold, the days come, says the Lord. Here it is, that I'll make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Jacob. Not according to the covenant I made with their fathers in the day I took them by the hand to bring them out of Egypt. This isn't a, this isn't a replay of the Ten Commandments. That's the old covenant which my covenant they broke. Although I was a husband unto them. By the way, that's quite significant. Who's the husband in the Old Testament? God. Who's the husband in the New Testament? Jesus. What's that say about Jesus? Jesus. If God's the husband in the Old Testament and Jesus is the bridegroom in the New Testament, it tells you an awful lot about Jesus, doesn't it? But this shall be the covenant that I'll make with the house of Israel. And after those days, says the Lord, I will put my law in their inward parts and write it in their hearts and will be their God and they shall be my people. What, what's God going to do? They're going to get a spiritual pacemaker. I'm going to put my law in their inward parts and write it in their hearts. And I'll be their God and they'll be my people. So it won't be obedience from, the, uh, from just, okay, I got to do this because God says so. There'll be something in the heart that says, that's just what I want to do. There'll be that recognition inside, this is good. When you hear people railing against the Ten Commandments, you know they don't have this yet. And so, as a result of that spiritual surgery, and they shall teach no more every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord for they'll all know me from the least of them to the greatest of them, says the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquity and will remember their sin no more. My law is going to be in their heart. They're going to know me, and I'm going to forgive them. Now, this has not happened yet for the Jewish people. This is future for them. In verse 35, Thus says the Lord who gives the sun for light by day and the ordinances of the moon and the stars for light by night, who divides the sea when its waves roar, the Lord of hosts is his name. If those ordinances depart before me, says the Lord, then the seed of Israel also shall cease from being a nation before me forever. Uh, I think Hamas has got an impossible job I think Iran has got an impossible job. Hezbollah has got an impossible job. We're going to destroy the Jews. We're going to, we're, we're going to, we're, we're, we're going to abolish them and get them all, kill them all and get them out of here. Not really. That's a fool's errand. Now, Jews, people aren't believers in Christ now. They're not saved yet, but they will be. And God says, I'm going to bring them back to the land, and when after that, I'm going to put my law in their heart, which means they're going to be saved and forgiven, and they're going to know me. Thus says the Lord, if heaven above can be measured and the foundations of the earth searched out beneath, I will also cast off all the seed of Israel for all they've done, which means I'm not going to do it. Behold, the days come, says the Lord, that the city will be built to the, to the Lord from the Tower of Hanuel to the gate of the corner, a measuring line will be set forth against the hill, and so forth and so on. So God was very clear here in this section. He's going to do something for the Jew in the future. And they, they have a future. And he's promised them a new covenant. The old covenant didn't work. On purpose, it wouldn't work. Uh, God set it up that way, just like the nine plagues didn't work, uh, and so forth. So the Jews on Passover are looking back to that redemption out of Egypt. And, of course, by Jesus' day, they had Jeremiah 31. So they were looking forward to the time God would do this. 
but God took Passover wine and Passover bread, and 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 Jesus said, um, "There's a new covenant." Well, wait a minute. We're not the church is not Israel. Oh, but we are wed to the Messiah, and He is of Israel. And so guess what? We get to celebrate our forgiveness, our knowledge of God ahead of time. Because when we're born again, we get a knowledge of God inside. We get a law inside that has an affinity for the Ten Commandments, even though we still fail in keeping them. So we have a partial uh, uh, involvement in this before the end of the history. And so Jesus, as the new covenant Messiah, introduce Passover. I mean, and, and had Passover, but then introduced the new covenant with the Lord's Supper, because the Lord's Supper celebrates the new covenant. So we got the Passover meal, and then we got the Lord's Supper. There's another feast, a third one, Turn with me to Matthew 26, and I'm going to close with this. They're all three in this text. And as they were eating, what were they eating? Passover. Jesus took bread. What kind of bread? Passover bread and blessed it and broke it and gave it to them. The disciples said, take, eat, this is my body. And he took the cup, that's Passover wine, gave thanks and gave it to them saying, drink ye all of it. Now, when I was a kid and we would have Lord's Supper, I used to think it meant you got to drink all the, <laughs> all the juice out of the cup. Don't dare leave any of it. But that's, he's, he said, he's speaking to all the people there. I want all of you, to drink this. All of you. Of course, they were all saved people there. Judas had left. And he said, for this is my blood of the New Testament. Same thing as the New Covenant, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. Remember Jeremiah. Now you see the connection. But then he said this. But I say to you, I will not drink henceforth of this fruit of the vine until the day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. That's an awesome statement. He promises another meal together when they will celebrate together, everything he has done. You see, the Lord's Supper is not the ultimate supper. There's the wedding supper of the Lamb. Revelation 19, verse 6 to 9. There's that marriage supper of the Lamb. And Jesus is here, says, I'm going to abstain from the fruit of the vine until that feast. You see, Passover looked back to Egypt. The Lord's Supper looks back to Jesus' death and looks forward to his coming. The, the marriage supper of the Lamb looks back on everything, the whole plan. Jesus slain before the foundation of the world, all that God did in the Old Testament to lead up to the cross, all that he's done in the church age because of the cross, and it's all going to be celebrated together. We're one little part of the church of Jesus Christ, aren't we? It's a few people here. God's people taking the cup, taking the bread, eating it together, None of us have got to do it with the whole church. When I was in college, I went to a big national college convention of Christians in Urbana in Illinois. And we were in a, we were in the gymnasium there 
University of Illinois. It was as big as a combo center. And they had the Lord's Supper together. And John Stott presided. And that was a new evangelical event and everything else, but I'll tell you, it was moving to take the Lord's Supper. Thousands of people. It was moving. I was only upset by one thing. The one who was leading it told everyone to abstain from pictures during the Lord's Supper, and many cameras were flashing off. That upset me. Yeah, clear instructions. Can't you take clear instructions? Do you have to have a picture? Can't you just focus on what we're doing? Because even in the best of services, in the best of times with the biggest crowds, it's all imperfectly done, isn't it? It's never perfect. Even the Corinthians sinfully did it and got under trouble, didn't they? William Cutley said of Jesus, he will resume his association with delight in his people here below. The godly have to drink his blood with thankful praise now. By and by, he will drink the wine of joy new with us in the Father's kingdom. Till then, he's the heavenly Nazarite. And consequently, should we be in spirit? Alexander McLaren said of that future feast in, in, uh, in the coming kingdom, at that solemn hour, Jesus stayed his own heart with the vision of the perfected kingdom and the glad festival there. So this communion has a prophetic element in it and links on with predictions and parables which speak of the marriage supper of the great king and of the time when we shall sit at table with him in his kingdom. And David Thomas said, every holy circle on earth as a reference to that fellowship in heaven is a foretaste and pledge of the social enjoyments of the blessed. Glad you come tonight. I'm glad we can take the bread Wait for one another, partake together. Take the cup, wait for one another, partake together. Um, you do not have to be a member of Athens Bible Church to take the Lord's Supper with us. We only ask that you be a Christian, you be saved and know you're saved. And you don't. And, and even if you're not saved, we're still glad you're with us. We want you here. We want you to observe us taking the Lord's Supper. We're not gonna examine you. We don't believe in doing that here. But the Bible does say, let a man examine himself. And so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. When I was young, I was not yet saved. And we had Lord's Supper. I had to let the bread go by and the cup go by. And it spoke to me more than 100 sermons. But I am not yet in fellowship with the one who died for me. I need to be saved. Finally, it got through. So for anyone that doesn't yet know the Lord, please stay. Don't, uh, don't leave. Stay uh, and just let the cup go by. Again, we won't, exa we won't examine you between you and God. But it's something that the God's people do. Look back at the cross and look forward to the coming of our Lord. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for the time we've spent tonight. Thank you for the simple gospel of Jesus Christ. There's such clarity in the Bible that we can't save ourselves by our good works, can't save ourselves in any way. We need a savior and Jesus is the savior. And he's a loving savior. He's our heavenly bridegroom. How many people have had marriages fail or marriage mates fail? or many disappointments, and often were disappoint, disappointments to each other, but not Jesus. He's the heavenly bridegroom who loved the church and gave himself for it. So we take the bread, we take the cup, 
and have a little taste of what it'll be someday to be with him in glory. And as the Jews remembered their redemption out of Egypt, we remember our redemption out of this world. Long for the trumpet to sound and the wedding to begin. In Jesus' name, amen. Lord, as we go from this place, loving you more, trusting you more, may the power of your love and the light of your word shine forth to a sin-darkened world as we go from